So we started off the topic of today's lesson with the idea that a force is a push or a pull. And now we see that we're going to get a little more detail with our definition. So really a force is an interaction between two objects causing each to push or pull on the other. So it's still the same idea, pushing and pulling, but you have to really remind yourself it's always about two objects interacting with each other. The units for force come from Newton's second law, sigma f equals ma, where mass, m, is in kilograms, and a, acceleration, is in meters per second squared. So we literally just combine those two units to make the kilogram meter per second squared. Always a good idea to put the multiplication dot in between kilograms and meters so you can see they're dissimilar units. We do rename the kilogram meter per second squared after Sir Isaac Newton, so it is capitalized in his honor. So this is one Newton is equivalent to one kilogram meter per second squared. I'm sort of giving it away here, but yes, force is a vector quantity. It has the vector arrow above it. Obviously, it matters in what direction these objects are pushing or pulling on each other. So capital F is for any sort of generic force. We look at all different special types of forces throughout the topic, but in the equation for Newton's second law is sigma F, and sigma F stands for net force. This is our next vocabulary term on the notes page. And the sigma stands for summation. It is the vector sum of all forces acting on an object. So just like we can combine displacements as vectors or velocities or accelerations as vectors, we'll be combining forces as vectors. And the net force, the vector sum, is really what matters. Now, this last part is what's super important. The net force is not a force. They never be able to identify a picture of forces acting and say, oh, there's the net force acting on it. That's not the way it works. What you will be looking at is all the forces that are acting on the object, and you're going to combine them as a vector sum to get the resultant, to get the net force. So it's not a singular force. It is the combination of all the forces together. But because it is a combination of forces, it's still measured in Newtons, and of course, it has a directionality to it, so it is a vector quantity. So on the back side of your notes page are some really quick examples to get the idea of how net force works. So in each of these, as it says, we're looking at a top-down view of a 6-kilogram object. Here in example 1, there are two forces, F1 and F2, pulling both to the right. Maybe these are two different people pulling with two different ropes. And I bet, make you bet your gut is going to tell you what the net force would be. Just pause the video and think about it. I'm sure you can see they're acting together. The net force is going to be 8 newtons specifically to the right. They're helping each other out. Okay, so if we were a little more complicated, this is how we would do it. First, we decide, uh, assign a positive direction, because of course, this is a vector quantity, and since they're both pointing to the right, might as well call to the right positive. And then to get sigma f, what we're going to do is we're going to combine both these forces with the proper sign according to what we've decided as the positive direction. So we'll say sigma f is positive f1 and positive f2. The positive signs here are indicating the direction of each of these forces, which is to the right, and we're calling it to the right positive. So I know that obviously we're going to add these two together to, in this case, get positive 8 newtons. Your gut instinct told you that, but when it gets more complicated, this is going to be our routine for figuring out what the net force might be. And of course, the positive sign means to the right, so alternatively, you can say it's 8 newtons to the right. These two forces are helping each other out. So go ahead and just look at example 2 and think what your gut is telling you what the net force would be. So hopefully you see 5 newtons to the right, 3 newtons to the left. It's like a tug of war, and who's winning? F2 is clearly winning. By how much? 2 newtons, right? So you can hopefully see that the net force is 2 newtons to the right. But if we're going to follow the same routines we did before, first we'll establish a positive direction. And I'm going to arbitrarily say, again, to the right is positive, because the larger force is that way. That's not always the way we're going to do it, but let's just say that is in this case. And in this case, we write sigma f is positive F2, because it's pointing to the right, and right is positive minus F1, because F1 is pointing to the left. So all we do is we look at the picture here, and we look at whichever way the forces are pointing, we put the proper sign right here, and sort of listing them. And now you can see it's F2 minus F1, or of course, positive 2 newtons, or 2 newtons to the right, which I'm hoping is what your gut instinct told you. F2 is winning over F1 by 2 newtons, and it's winning in the, in the rightward direction. And this sort of sets up the tone for how we're going to be approaching even much more complicated problems when there's many more forces acting all together. Let's go continue on the notes page. We're now be looking at a baseball in free fall. So there's a picture of the baseball. And what we're first going to consider is which way the baseball is moving, which way it's accelerating. So what does your gut tell you? Which way is this baseball moving? I imagine a lot of you probably say it's moving down. 
But remember, we just got done with the whole couple topics on free fall and motion, and we know that objects just certainly not have to be moving just down to be in free fall. Remember, free fall is a misnomer, it's not falling motion. We know that you can release an object going upwards, and once you let go, it's in free fall. So we really don't know which way this baseball is moving. So we're not going to draw a vector for its velocity, but no matter what, whichever way it's moving, we should know which way the baseball is accelerating. And hopefully you're saying down, of course, right? Because it's being pulled down by gravity. So the acceleration is pointing down. So I'm going to draw a vector off to the side. I'd like you to do the same to show the acceleration. So what's causing this acceleration? Well, hopefully you're saying it's the force of gravity. So we're going to put that force vector right there on the picture of the baseball attached to it. And it's pointing straight down. And what about F sub G for the force of gravity? We'll encounter a couple different ways to write that. But right now, F sub G is good for the force of gravity. In fact, there is another name for the force of gravity, something you're probably very familiar with. This is known as weight. In physics, we define weight as the force of gravity. They are literally the same thing. So every single time you hear weight, you're thinking force of gravity. Every single time you hear force of gravity, you're thinking weight. So weight is the force of gravity. Force of gravity is weight. Weight is the force of gravity. The force of gravity is weight. The gravitational force is weight. Yeah, so just because I reordered the words doesn't change anything. Gravitational force, force of gravity means the exact same thing. So we define weight as the force of gravity, and the symbol we'll use for weight is going to be lowercase w, and it is a force, so of course it has a directionality to it. It is a vector quantity. What units is weight measured in? Hmm, well, it is the force of gravity, and we just mentioned how force is measured in newtons, so its units are newtons as well. Now, these are not the units you're probably familiar with, you're more familiar with pounds, and pounds are fine for units of uh, force, of for, really for any force, but specifically for weight, but newtons is our metric unit. So our symbol for weight is going to be lowercase w, and it is a vector quantity, so we're going to put the vector arrow above it, and so, so instead of writing f sub g, you can write w for weight. That's absolutely fine. Now, going back to our picture of the baseball, are there any other forces acting on it? Well, remember, we always neglect air resistance. And so hopefully you're saying, well, no, of course not. It's in free fall. And our definition of free fall is motion only influenced by the force of gravity, by weight. So this is the entire picture of all the forces acting on the baseball. Now let's write sigma f equals ma, Newton's second law. We don't have to write a huge like we did on the front of the notes page. Just normal size is absolutely fine. And sigma f says we put together all of the forces acting on the object. In this case, there's only one force, the force of gravity, also known as weight. So in this case, the net force is just w, the weight. And m is the mass. But what about the acceleration? Well, it's in free fall. We know what the acceleration is. Of course, 9.8 meters per second squared down. Or what's our symbol for that? Remember, that's the symbol lowercase g for acceleration due to gravity. And so by putting this together for this particular situation, we actually now have the equation to find an object's weight. Let's go ahead and box it in, put the vector arrows where they belong, over the w for weight, over the g for acceleration due to gravity. And the great thing about this equation is that it doesn't only apply for an object in free fall. This is actually our definition of weight. So you can find an object's weight no matter what the situation is, by taking the mass and multiplying by the acceleration due to gravity. Normally, we don't worry about the vector nature of it. We know that, yes, of course, the ways the force of gravity points straight down. Usually, we just care about the magnitude of an object's weight. So don't really worry about the directionality. Just be aware, of course, it does point straight down. So let's do a little practice with this right there on your notes page. Go ahead and solve this problem, find the weight of a 60 kilogram student, and then convert it into the more traditional units of pounds. So it should be real simple here. Obviously, we're going to use our new equation, W equals mg, and it's 60 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. It's a three sig fig problem, so you should be getting 588 kilogram meters per second squared, or as we now define it, as newtons, 588 newtons. And now, separately, you're going to convert this into pounds with this conversion factor, one pound equals 4.45 newtons. We do our usual unit conversion setup here, where we're going to multiply by the conversion factor, put newtons in the denominator to get rid of newtons in the numerator, and we should end up with 132 pounds. So you can see that these numbers are ones you might be familiar with. Maybe you are a weight around here, or someone you know is a weight around 132 pounds, right? So this might be like the weight of a, a typical person in high school. 
Obviously, everyone has a different mass and a different weight, and we're not going to uh, worry about that. But this is, you know, a weight of someone maybe around your age, perhaps. So this gives you a sense of the sort of numbers involved, which means people of your age have masses around 60 kilograms, maybe 50 or 60 or 70 kilograms. That would be the mass of a, a high school student, which means that people in high school weigh 500, 600, 700 newtons. So it's just a different way of thinking about it, a different system of units. Let's go back onto the front of the notes page where we're going to finish up Newton's laws with his third law, one I'm sure you remember from third grade science or watching Bill Nye the Science Guy. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now, it turns out of the three laws, this is actually the one that's most misunderstood because most people have heard it before and they still don't really get what it means. And it's because the words that Newton used have changed meaning over time, which is quite, quite natural. Language evolves. He wrote these laws in the 1600s, and the words we're talking about here are action and reaction. So we're going to rewrite Newton's third law right there under the original statement of it. Let's write an updated version of it. We'll say it like this. Forces always come in equal and opposite pairs that occur at the same time. So I'm not stepping on Newton's toes. I'm saying the th same thing he did, equal and opposite, sure. I'm just updating the language, this idea if they occur at the same time. So you're going to do a little bit of a demonstration for yourself, right wherever you are, just a little bit of space on your desk or wherever it is you're writing, and take your right hand and as hard as you can, hit the surface. Go ahead and do it now. See, I did it. Okay. Do it again if you need to. Okay. So how does your hand feel? Ow, right? It hurts. But wait, why is your hand hurt? Your hand hit the desk. Why is your hand hurt? Oh, it's because the desk hit back, right? And it turns out it happened at the exact same moment. Those two forces, your hand hitting the desk and the desk hitting back, occurred at the exact same moment in time. And we update the language here because of the words action, reaction that Newton used. He meant those to, to mean forces, but over time those words have changed meaning. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're in English class and you get a paper back and you didn't do too well, you were staying up real late, and it wasn't your best effort, so you bring it home, and your parents know you're supposed to get the paper home, so they want to see it, so they say, oh, show me your paper. So you say, uh, okay, and you hand the paper over to your parents, and there's the action, and then your parents take the paper, and they're flipping through, and they're so excited to see your grade, and they're like, oh, 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 that's, that's a lot of red, and oh, what was that? And, and then they finally see the grade, and they're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? And, and that's the reaction, and, and there's this delay between the action of giving the paper and the reaction that your parents have, and that's the way we use the words in everyday language. But that's not what Newton meant. Newton, when he said action, reaction, meant them to be forces. And forces always occur at the exact same moment. Let me give you another example. So let's say you're in English class again, another paperback, another bad grade. And this time you don't know what you're going to do. Your parents are not going to be happy. The anger is just bubbling up inside of you, so you turn the person next to you and you pop them one in the face. So now I never advocate violence because the next thing that's going to happen is both you and your seating partner are going to be sent over to the assistant principal's office. The assistant principal is going to sit you down and say, what happened? You're going to say, I don't know. His hand came out of nowhere and hit me in the face. Now, it is true at the exact moment that your fist hit his face, his face hit back with an equal and opposite force. You're not going to get out of being in trouble with this because you initiated the contact. I mean, it's not like the person took his head and hit your fist with it. No one fights like that. At least no one ever wins fights like that. So you can't use physics to get out of this. But it is true. At the exact moment your fist hit his face, his face hit your fist back with an equal and opposite force. And there was no delay. It happened at the exact same moment. So another way to think about Newton's third law is this sort of small statement that's going to encapsulate it all, that there's always two objects involved. There are always two forces involved, and together that makes a single interaction. Forces can never occur in isolation. There's always pairs of forces that are equal and opposite. So again, just to finish up here at the bottom of your notes page, when Newton said action-reaction, he was referring to forces. And in fact, sometimes we say action-force and reaction force. But even if they don't say action force and reaction force, if we use the words action reaction, in your mind you're thinking, ah, that refers to forces and there's no delay with those forces acting on each other. As opposed to the way we use the words today where there's an action first, there's a delay, and then there's a reaction. That's the way we use it in everyday language, but not in physics. In physics, when we say action reaction, we're referring to forces, and forces occur at the exact same moment in equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. You're going to go ahead and box in each of Newton's three laws, first law, second law, third law, in the word version as big ideas. They are some of the biggest. We'll be using them throughout the year.